So in this message series, we've been asking the question, who is Jesus? And today we're going to ask the question, where is Jesus now? You know, we, we've been talking about the past, what Jesus did when he came here to earth, but what about today? What is Jesus' relevance for us today? Well, there's a, there was a TV show on VH1 a number of years ago called Where Are They Now? And this show looked kind of backwards at the life of someone who was famous, and it kind of looked back at some of the things that they had did, and then told a little bit about what they were doing today. We have a special episode of that show today. It's probably one you haven't seen before, so check this out. Welcome to Where Are They Now on VH1. In this episode, we will look at the most famous man to ever walk the face of this earth. No, we're not talking about SpongeBob SquarePants. We're talking about Jesus of Nazareth. He's a busy guy who doesn't do many TV interviews nowadays. So we caught up with St. Peter, one of his most outstanding disciples. Peter, rumor has it that you are the first person that an individual sees when they enter heaven. Is that true? Well, I've never been one to brag. You'd better believe it. <laughs> Why, I've even got a picture of it. Peter? <laughs> You're not playing that you better believe that I said Heaven's Gate game again, are you? <laughs> no, of course not, Lord. <laughs> uh, I was just getting ready to tell them about Jesus. Uh, yeah, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you remember Jesus' first miracle? Do I remember? How could I forget? Check this out. There was this huge wedding. Everybody who's anybody was there. I just started following Jesus, and he invited us disciples to come to the feast. Everything was going great at this wedding. <laughs> Storybook, fairy tale, picture perfect, whatever. <laughs> it was awesome. That is, until one very, very bad thing happened. They ran out of wine. Everybody was so shocked and the couple was so embarrassed. Oh, you have to understand how bad this was. In our culture, nobody, nobody ran out of wine at the wedding, ever. Even the cheapest of cheapskates were sure to have enough wine on hand. I looked over at Jesus. You know, he wasn't that big of a drinker, but he seemed a little upset and really nervous. He wasn't sitting still, kind of shifting around in his chair. Then his mom came up and he said, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Ha, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> what were you thinking? Who calls their mother woman? <laughs> Boy, in my family, that's a good way to get smacked upside the head. But his mom didn't even bat an eye. It was like she knew he was going to do something amazing. Had he been practicing miracles at home or something? Uh, I don't know. But what I do know is that she wouldn't let him off the hook. She said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. I couldn't believe that she said that. It was like she totally ignored what Jesus had said. He seemed nervous, almost like he needed a little push to do something. And boy, he sure did do something. No joke. He turned that water into wine. Now, if you want to do a miracle that will make you popular, I really suggest turning water into wine. Everybody was going nuts. Who would have thought that the Son of God was going to be good at making wine, huh? 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 He would have been so much more popular in high school if he would have done that. Duh. <laughs> uh, but no, he was all like, do unto others as you'd have done unto you, and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but Jesus... <laughs> I love that guy. Wow, sounds like your ministry with Jesus had a wild start. Yeah, it was amazing. I was, uh, you know, one of the favorites. I was always leading the way. Uh, the guys, well, they all looked up to me. <laughs> hey, what's with the rooster? No idea. 
It seems to bother you. Bother me? Uh, well, it's a long story, but uh, can you just keep that thing quiet? So what's Jesus up to nowadays? Well, that is a great question. He's pretty busy nowadays. Doing what? Hey, I swear, shut that thing up. You've really got a problem with those roosters. Bad memories. Anyway, today, Jesus sits up here in heaven at God the Father's right hand. I'm not even kidding. He's up there and he's praying for you people down here on earth. It's amazing. He loves you so much that he's talking to God the Father about you, reminding him of how much he loves you, how he gave his life for you. And let me tell you, that's one mighty big job. You guys do a lot of dumb stuff and he's continually praying for you. It's incredible. Why, somebody should preach a sermon on it. Pastor John? Look, I know you're a little dense, but this is your cue. <laughs> oh, fuck. That's it. I'm not even, I'm out of here. Wait, Peter, don't. <laughs> All right, so straight from Peter's mouth, what's Jesus doing today? He's interceding for us. That same love that Jesus had for people, that even something that seems so insignificant, a, a wedding party, that he went out of his way to show love to others around him then, he has that same kind of love for us. So how does that love get lived out for us today? Well, Jesus, of course, we, we know he's up in heaven. That probably didn't shock any of you. Um, but what is he doing? What, what is he doing? Uh, a few things in your notes. The first thing you'll see is that Jesus is God the Father's right-hand man, if you will, in heaven. Colossians 3.1 says this, Since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at God's right hand in the place of honor and power. Okay, right hand. In, the, in those days, what that meant was that he would be like uh, God the Father's number one person right there. Okay, That was where if you were a king or a ruler and you were sitting around a table, you would have your most important person sitting right there beside you, a, a vice president or whatever, if you will. And so Jesus is right there with God, the second member of the Trinity, and he's in heaven with God. But what's he do? It's not like he's on some like eternal retirement plan here where he just plays a lot of golf and does that kind of stuff, right? He is active in heaven. Uh, in fact, the Bible tells us, uh, secondly, that Jesus is our defense attorney, if you will. We're going to unpack that a little bit today. What does that mean? Jesus is our defense attorney. Because you see, we have an accuser. The word Satan, the name Satan, literally means accuser. So we have one who is regularly reminding us and everybody else that we're sinners, that we mess up, and so Jesus is at God's right hand there, uh, representing us, representing us to God the Father. What does he do? Well, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 2. You can turn there in your Bibles or check it out with me on the screen, beginning in verse 1. John says this, My dear children, I am writing this so that you will not sin. But if you do sin, there is someone who will plead with you before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who pleases God completely. He is the sacrifice for our sins. He takes away not only our sins, but all the sins of the world. Okay, so he writes these things so we will not sin. But of course, we know the problem. That is, we do continue to sin. And so what then? What happens next? Well, we have this, this advocate, this one who is there with God, who is pleading for us. That is Jesus Christ. And that should impact the way that we live. You see, we as Christians, we sin and we mess up, and we don't want to just accept that. We don't want to just say, oh, I'm just always going to sin. That is how it is. You know, God will just forgive me and love me no matter what. We want to instead have sin be something that we truly hate. We talked about last week how Jesus became sin for us, how he took our sins to the cross, and that should make us hate sin. That should make us want to do our best to eradicate sin in our life. 
see the mark in your notes, you'll see that the mark of a true believer is not that they are sinless, but that they hate their sins so much that they develop a reflex of confession and repentance. You have reflexes, right? Like if uh, you're with someone and they go, they suddenly kind of take a smacking motion towards your face. You probably blink or move back a little bit, right? Put your hands up. Because, well, we don't want to get hit. That's just a normal thing. You don't need to logically analyze that and say, hmm, my, you know, the person I thought with my, was my friend is now swinging at me. Perhaps I should do something about it. I don't know. We'll see. You don't do that. It's just a reflex. You just do it. And, and we should develop that about sin. That when we sin, that we have this natural reflex that says, I want to be in a right relationship with God. I don't want to live in this sin, so I want to confess it. And I want to take steps towards repentance, towards turning, towards living differently than how I have been living. So how do we recover after we sin? I love what uh, Spurgeon said. He said this, For the Christian, after he or she has sinned, however sweet it may have been in their mouth, it quickly becomes bitterness in the bowels. This is true, right? He's saying, comparing sin, and he says, sin, no matter how much fun it is in the moment, how good it seems at the time, in time it becomes that bitterness. After you eat that thing, it becomes that bitterness in the bowels. We're talking like Taco Bell at midnight kind of thing, right? Seemed like a good idea at the time, but the next day, not so much. Saying this is what sin should be like in our life. That we should hate it that much. That even though it seemed good at the time, later we realize that we want to turn from that. We want to develop that reflex that helps us to, to live differently. And, and we don't want to be flippant about it. We don't want to be just, you know, well, you know, I sinned, God loves me, and so thus God has to forgive me because I'm just so lovable and certainly in God's love, God would want to just forgive me. Because we have to remember that God is a just God. I mean, yes, God certainly loves us. That's why He sent Jesus. But there is a payment that had to be made for our sins. And that payment could only be made by Jesus Christ. God is a just God. And so He had to punish sin. You and I, we really want sin to be punished too. Maybe not in our own life, but in the lives of others, I can assure you we do. Like for example... Let's say that you went home after church and, God forbid, somebody had broken into your house and stolen some of your favorite things. That would be terrible. You'd be angry, you'd be frustrated, you'd call the police. And let's say that they came out and they, they caught the person and they brought him in for questioning. Certain, sure enough, they were busted. It was, the person was clearly guilty. And so then you hear from the prosecutor and the prosecutor says, you know, I, I interviewed the person who robbed your house and I'm really sorry about all your losses, but... After talking to him, he really seems like a nice guy. If you got to know him, I think you'd agree that he seems to be a good person. So I'm not going to bother prosecuting because I just, I loved spending time with him, honestly. I couldn't possibly take him to court. That'd be ridiculous. What would you say? I wouldn't be too happy. I'd say, seriously, this guy broke in, he stole my stuff, and all you can say is, hmm, he seems like a nice guy. We should let him go because he's a friendly person, right? No, we want justice. We want that sin to be punished. Because if someone is truly just, sin must be punished. God must punish sin. And so Jesus came and gave His life for you and for me. And today, Jesus is our defense attorney. Now, if you've ever gotten yourself into some trouble and you've, or you've been accused of something you didn't do and you needed an attorney, you know how this works. You hire someone and this person represents you. They go into the court and they represent you before the judge. You want to pick your attorney well. I mean, if you pick that attorney who's like, you know, just finished law school like yesterday and never really done this much and gets into court and he kind of looks like a bumbling idiot, guess what you look like? A bumbling idiot, right? Because he's representing you. Whereas if you hire a different attorney and she comes in and she represents you well and makes this just solid uh, airtight case and before the judge, you're sitting there and you're thinking, I am glad that I hired her because things are going to be okay now for me because of the case that she's making for me. So you need to have a good attorney. And Jesus is our defense attorney. 
it, it, some of you know that in my family, uh, my father has uh, dementia. Uh, dementia was kind of an early onsetting thing for him a few years back. And it's a slow progression, and it's something that impacts uh, the way that his brain makes decisions. So he doesn't have the same ability that you and I have to know if something is a good decision or a bad decision. And I love my dad very much, but in our family, one of the things we've given ourselves permission to do is to laugh about it, because sometimes it is quite comical. In fact, some of his decisions aren't really what you'd want to make if you were him. I remember a few years back, I was back visiting uh, for the weekend, or my family and I, yeah, we were visiting my parents. And it was Sunday morning, we were going to go to church, and we couldn't find my dad anywhere. So we went to church, came back, still couldn't find him. And there was an answering machine message that said he had been arrested. He had never been arrested before. He has a a speeding ticket record a mile long, but never been arrested. And so we went to get him, we bailed him out, and he was furious. And uh, we were talking to him, and he was talking about how terrible the city and the system and all this stuff is. And finally, we got it out of him what he had done. He had gone to the local park there, uh, which had some trees that were older trees that that were he didn't think were looking good, so he decided to do the city a favor and cut them down and set them on fire. And they didn't appreciate his help, actually. Their term for it was felony destruction of property. His term for it was help. And so we have some differing of opinions here. And so I said, well, Dad, you're going to need a good attorney because this is a pretty serious charge. It's a felony. And he said, I don't need an attorney. I am going to represent myself. Okay. So what's your defense going to be? My defense is going to be that the city is so stupid that they don't keep the parks cleaned up. If they would take care of it better, I wouldn't have to go and do this. <laughs> So in your defense, you're admitting that you did it, right? Of course I did it. Okay, well, that's going to be a problem because <laughs> when you admit you did it, you pretty much say that they've won. So, so you're not likely to get a real soft sentence this way. So, well, I blame the fire department. I said, really? How do you blame the fire department? He goes, well, because the, they told me that they have put out several fires recently like this, and I told them that's right. If they would have left me a note, I would quit setting those fires. (laughs) So you admitted to a variety of other crimes as well, didn't you? Great. So so I said, okay, so if that's your defense, what are you going to do next? Because they're going to be guilty. He said, well, I will ask for community service to be my punishment. Okay? You don't get to tell them what your punishment, though, is. Remember, that's what the attorney comes in there for. But he didn't even hear that. He said, I will ask for community service, and for my punishment, I will go back and I will finish that job. (laughs) We are definitely getting an attorney, even if I pay for it. We're getting an attorney because you can't do that. So we hired this great attorney who represented him well, who demonstrated his condition. Of course, he still had fines and all that stuff, as he should. Uh, But he was able to avoid jail time and avoid a felony as a result. Your attorney represents you, and your attorney impacts the way that you look to the judge. And let me tell you something. We could not have a better better defense attorney than Jesus Christ. You can't understand Jesus' role as an attorney unless you understand what He did for us on the cross. You see, His argument is interesting. Because there we are in heaven, and and John has sinned once again, and Satan the accuser is saying, see, there he goes. Once again, a sinner, he's uh, distanced himself from God. The wages, the payment for sin is death. And, And Jesus steps forward to the stand. And what does he say? He doesn't even deny it. He doesn't say, oh no, he didn't do that stuff. That's one defense attorneys use, is you know, that you can't prove it, right? He's innocent until proven guilty. How can you prove that? He doesn't make that defense. He doesn't make some insanity plea, or he doesn't say, well, check his record, but as a whole, he's been a pretty good guy, right? I think we should let him off the hook this time, because he's doing okay. No, he doesn't make that defense. Instead, Jesus steps forward, and he says, Satan, you are absolutely right. Once again, John has sinned, he's distanced himself from God, and and he deserves death. However... I have a few pieces of evidence that I would like to enter into this trial. And so he brings forth these pictures of his nail-pierced hands and feet, his beaten back, 
his, his bloody brow with the crown of thorns on it. And he says, you might remember that I took John's sins on my shoulders to the cross so that John being dead to sin might know eternal life. That he might become God's righteousness. Not because he deserves it, because we all know he doesn't. But instead, that he might become that simply because of what I've done. And the fact is, you can't punish somebody twice for the same sin. That's not justice. And Jesus Christ, He took my punishment. He took your punishment. On the basis of His atoning work, we get to go free. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty airtight argument to me. That's a pretty solid argument. Because God looks at us differently. He looks at us and we are forgiven not because we're so lovable. We're forgiven only because Jesus did that for us. Only because of His sacrifice for you and for me. And that's incredible freedom that we have. We were the ones who should have been dead and yet He is the one who gave His life for us. And the Bible tells us in the book of Galatians that it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. You know what that's like? It's like when we sin and we continue to beat ourselves up over and over and over. And we're ridden with that guilt, that shame. And, and for some of us, we've been dealing with that for a long time. Maybe for some, there's, there's not a, a month or a week or maybe even a day that doesn't go by that you remember that thing or those things that you did. That if we put them on the screen, you'd be so embarrassed. And you say, God, I, I don't know how you can possibly use me. I don't know how you can because I've messed up. I've messed up so much in my life. I don't really understand how you can forgive me and I certainly don't understand how you can use me. And the fact is, friends, Jesus didn't die so that we can live like that. He died so that we can be free. Free. Free from that burden of sin. Free from that burden of guilt and shame. Not because we're so impressed with ourselves, but because we understand His sacrifice. And we understand the freedom that that brings. And you too can be free from sin. You too can be freed from that guilt. Freed from that burden. You don't need to keep beating yourself up anymore. God has already taken His wrath out on Jesus. Don't you keep taking it out on yourself. Live into that freedom. Don't let an ounce of Christ's sacrifice go to waste. Live into that freedom. And it's the fullness that it brings. Because God loves you that much. Your life matters that much. Now to accept this truth sometimes takes us some time. Maybe you need to confess your sins to other people. Maybe you've got your community group or a best friend or, or a pastor or a counselor. Do it. We're here. Use us. We want for you to be freed from that stuff. I remember a few years ago, uh, meeting with a guy named Bob. Bob was someone I had tremendous respect for. Bob was a World War II veteran. He served in our youth ministry way back when. Bob was in his 80s when he served in our youth ministry. And he was one of the best youth volunteers I'll ever get to work with. I mean, he had such a big heart for those kids. They would, they would come in the door and they would kind of say hey to me and they would run and give Bob these huge hugs because he was like the grandpa to everybody. This incredible guy. And I remember one day he came in and he was notably upset and said, hey, what's up, Bob? Let's talk. And he began to tell me about uh, an incident that happened uh, many, many decades before in the war uh, where he had had to shoot a German soldier at point-blank range. And it was, it was uh, just, if you will, it was an act of war. It, was, you know, it wasn't that he was doing anything that you wouldn't expect a soldier to do. But he had never been able to, to lose the guilt of that act. He had always wondered, he said almost every day, what was it like when his parents got the news? What was it like when his family heard the news that he was dead? And he was so ridden by that guilt of having pulled that trigger. And we talked and we prayed and, and, and Bob seemed to think that he needed God's forgiveness in all of this. And that gets into a whole lot of other things. But, but Bob found that forgiveness because he was willing to open up and share. And it wasn't like I had any magical words or anything like that. I didn't. 
there's a lot of power sometimes in just sharing with somebody else, in, in getting those burdens that you've stuffed down, getting them, off, uh, getting, getting them off of your plate, letting God take those things, letting God heal you. Don't be weighed down by that burden of sin. Live into that freedom that Christ has given us. It truly is an incredible freedom that He has given us. Verse 3. How do we sure that we belong to Him? Okay, so we've given our lives to Him. How do we know it? By obeying His commandments. Okay, so do you, know, do you belong to Jesus? Number one, do you obey? Do you obey? Because in obedience, in obedience, we demonstrate that, that we are following Jesus. He continues and says, if someone says I belong to God but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and doesn't live in the truth. Doesn't really, you know, cut any corners here, right? Saying, if you say you follow Jesus, but you don't do anything to follow Jesus, you're not actually following Jesus. But those who obey God's word really do love him. This is the way they know whether we live in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Christ did. That's a hard standard. We don't walk it out perfectly. But I would ask you, are you growing in obedience? Are you growing in obedience to God? Let that be a process every, every day, every week, every month, every year that you're saying, Jesus, I want to look more like you. I want to grow more fully into that grace. Verse 9, if anyone says, I am living in the light, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is still living in the darkness. Anyone who loves other Christians is living in the light and does not cause anyone to stumble. Anyone who hates a Christian brother or sister is living and walking in the darkness. Such a person is lost having been blinded by the darkness. It's an interesting metaphor, isn't it? Blinded by the darkness that we can't even see that when we don't love others, we're not loving God. Because our love for God and our love for each other have got to go hand in hand. You heard earlier in this, in this service about a great tangible way you can show God's love. Our special friends ministry. And I would expand that out to our children's ministry as a whole. You saw the third graders. We have an incredible opportunity, church, to impact these kids who are the church today and the church tomorrow. Not only opportunity, we have responsibility. I told you last week that 80%, 75 to 80% of people who become followers of Jesus do so before they're 18. That means these kids, Stillwater may be the one church that they attend, the one church who's got that 80% opportunity to share Jesus with them. And we're not going to drop the ball, friends. We're going to do our best. And we need you. This is like an all-hands-on-deck kind of thing. This is not a matter of like, oh yeah, I think we have a children's director and she'll do a good job of that, right? Children's director's job is to help equip and inspire a team and, and run that team each and every weekend. And we need you. Because you know something, as a youth pastor, I, I had Bob with me. And if I wouldn't have had Bob, I wouldn't have been nearly as good. Because Bob could do things that John could never do. And you can do things that our staff can't do. You can have impact on kids that is bigger than what's happening today. So we challenged you last week with something really simple. We need for 40 folks to say, yeah, I want to show God's love to, to my, my little brothers and sisters in the children's wing. Uh, I'm going to give up one hour a month, one ministry hour a month, 12 months out of the year. That's not too shabby. All of us can do that. All of us can do that. And uh, after the service, uh, Sue and Ashley, they'll be right out there in the lobby. They'd love to talk with you, give you more info. I know a number of you went home and prayed about it. Challenge you today to go out and sign up. We've got all sorts of different ways to do it. It doesn't matter if you don't do diapers. We've got lots of jobs that don't involve diapers. It doesn't matter if you don't do upfront talking in front of people. Lots of jobs that don't involve that. Doesn't matter if you don't do teach a lesson. Lots of jobs that don't involve that. We just need you to be willing and to take that risk and let Jesus work through you. Let's pray. God, thank you for this team of missionaries that sits in front of me. Missionaries to children that you bring into this place. God, you brought 113 of them here on Friday night to watch a movie, and we give you praise for the incredible opportunity that you are giving us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful. I pray that you would help us to be able to, to uh, have the children's ministry that you are calling us to be, to have so that we can make new disciples of you for the transformation of the world. God, thank you so much for how you work through this church. Lord, we love you and pray this in your name. Amen.